am picking sucker to go to jail when I could have gone to any one of the best jails in New York City. But another thing I want... She's Texas Guinan, better known as Queen of the Nightclubs. Her hoarse cry of, hello, sucker, was just one cue for madness during that year of frenzy, 1927. I was simply the victim of politics. I shall wreck the fence again, and I shall... century, the magic of moving pictures has enabled us to preserve our past. In newsreel archives and in rare films from private collections, we may find an indelible record of our time. I'm John Willis. We've tapped these repositories of film to present an impression of one colorful but raucous part of our time. This is what it was like to live in that frantic year the entire nation went on a holiday binge, thriving on stunts, sensation, and value the eventful year that marked both a peak and a change in the era of wonderful nonsense. Someone once called it the year of the big shriek. Others have characterized it as the year America went mad. This is the sight, the sound, the story of that year, the year 1927. <laughs> Every night is New Year's Eve as America drinks an illegal toast to Coolidge prosperity and shouts, let's make whoopee, let's get high. the nightclub era. Countless whoopee parlors offer big spenders from the social register to rogues gallery, the best in bootleg liquor, and a wide variety of entertainment, such as Eddie Jackson and Jimmy Durante. Broadway with my ten children? Yeah? And a policeman come up to me and said, under arrest. For what? I said, for what? I didn't do nothing. Nah. He said, you must have done something with that crowd following you. What? <laughs> Star of George White Scandal, Harry Richmond. As bootlegging becomes a major American industry, its most persuasive saleswoman is that irrepressible queen of New York nightlife, Texas Guinness. If Jimmy Walker runs the city by day, Texas Guinan surely runs it by night, writes one reporter. At Guinan's place, it's $25 for a bottle of scotch, $2 for a pitcher of water. Says Tex, never give a sucker an even break. <laughs> The conveyor belts of industry set the tempo for the time, as old products and new are turned out in numbers never seen before. Led by the auto industry, mass production seems the key to front plenty. These are the boom days, and for most Americans, time for a spree. It's a buyer's market, and if you pay cash, you can always get it on time. In overwhelming quantity, the products of mass production go on display. To meet competition, to create demand, a new kind of advertising. To be young, 
to be desirable. Buy. Buy to be envied. Buy to be happy. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm blue. My disposition depends on you. I never mind the rain from the sky. If I can find sunshine in your eyes. Sometimes I love you, sometimes I hate you. But when I hate you, it's cause I love you. That's how I am. Ads play upon the private fears, the vanity of people. Is your bathroom paper safe? Don't fool yourself. Decency demands it. Will your feet make lines in your face? Stay young with your daughter. Grandmother is still dancing. Her face is young but her figure betrays her age. Enter the it girl of the newspapers, Peaches Browning, Sweet Sixteen. Fame and fortune had come when Peaches met rich Danny Browning at one of the high school sorority dances he liked to sponsor. Why shouldn't I help little girls, says Daddy, unaware that their marital bliss will soon end in a headline sensation. With the growth of newspaper chains, in 1927, News 2 is mass-produced to sell sensation. And the nation, at the peak of its material fortunes, goes berserk in the mad pursuit of headline trivia, stunts, and scandal. Crazy work, crazy do, all and I am here to do. Everything's going up, from the stock market to aerial stunts, and the country goes wild. is the limit. The airplane is thought unsafe for travel, but it makes a thrilling toy. The greatest start of all begins on the misty morning of May 20th, as a young airmail pilot hastens to be the first to fly non-stop from New York to Paris. He hopes to capture a $25,000 prize for which the world's top aviators are competing. His name is Charles A. Lindbergh. He's the dark horse in the transatlantic air race. But the crowds are with him. For unlike the others, he flies alone. The field is soft with rain. The little monoplane with neither radio nor safety equipment is heavily loaded with fuel. Ahead, 3,600 miles to Paris, and all America vicariously shares every lonely mile. In the cold gray dawn, when the stars were gone, in a mighty aeroplane, flew a boy in search of fame, far across the bounding main, like the bird on high out to do our Oh! 
upon some future day. But take your hats off to Plucky Lucky Lindbergh, the eagle of the USA. America's impatient for its hero's return. President Coolidge has the Navy bring him home. And the nation's six million radios tune in on his arrival. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, this is Graham McNamee speaking from the Navy Yard, Washington, D.C. Awaiting Lindbergh. Lindbergh is coming down with the gang quest. A darn nice boy. Unassuming, quiet, very serious, and awfully nice. As President of the United States, I bestow the distinguished flying cross as a symbol of appreciation for what he is and what he has done upon Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh. In New York, the greatest welcome in the history of the city for the boy who flew to Paris alone. Lindbergh begins to tour the nation, and in the words of F. Scott Fitzgerald, for a moment people set down their glasses in country clubs and speakeasies and thought of their old best dreams. Others may make a trip across the sea upon some future day, but take your hats off to Lucky Lucky Lindbergh, the eagle of the USA. In 1927, almost every night is opening night on the Great White Way. More than 70 theaters appeal to every taste. For sugar daddies and tired butter and egg men, Florence prepares the 21st edition of the Follies that glorify the American girl. Irving assists at the piano as Eddie Cantor rehearses for the Ziegfeld Follies of 1927. Georgie Porgy is a guy who is very bashful and so shy. The ladies prize him. They idolize him. You can find him most anywhere in a great big cozy Morris chair. I've been looking at the ceiling while some girly is appealing. Oh, gee, Georgie, whenever I'm with you. Oh, gee, Georgie, I don't know what to do. You never tease or hug or squeeze like Donnie or Joe. You look at me and then, oh, gee, I get so I don't know, oh, gee, Georgie, what can it be? When you're around, I get so excited. You're not handsome like a statue, but it's time that I look at you. Oh, gee, Georgie, oh, gee. In 1927, the movies also prosper. They are attended by 60 million people every week. Elegant movie palaces are built to present silent films like this one, starring the it girl of the screen, Clara Bow. ushers in a new era in motion pictures. With the premiere of the jazz singers starring Al Jolson, sound comes to the screen. I, I'm a coming, sorry, 
I made you wait. I, I'm coming. I hope and trust I'm not late. Mammy, Mammy, I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles for my Mammy. Even baseball hero Babe Ruth sings for the camera. Hey, Babe! Considered all washed up, Babe Ruth begins the 27th season with a vow to break his own record of 59 homers. It will mean a home run contest with Lou Gehrig, his youthful Yankee teammate. Millions of fans root for the Babe to hit 59 as he did before. And just one more. Do, do, do what you do, did, did, did before, baby. Do, do, do what I do, 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 adore, baby. Let's try again, try again, try again to heaven. No, 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 a darker contest engaging many hearts and minds is the state of Massachusetts versus San Benzetti. After seven years of bitter controversy, the two men will now be sentenced to die by Judge Webster Thayer, who has refused all requests for an appeal. Convicted of a payroll murder in 1921, of which they claim innocence, the shoemaker Sacco and the mustached fish peddler Vanzetti are alien anarchists. This, say their supporters, has been their only crime. All through the summer, thousands protest the execution scheduled for August. They argue that prejudice, not evidence, convicted the men and demand a new trial. Many, including the communists, cry innocent simply because Sacco and Vanzetti are radicals, while others cry guilty for the very same reason. As the execution date nears, a special committee decides that the condemned have received a fair trial. All appeals are denied. After seven long years, on August 23rd, Sacco and Vanzetti are executed. The controversy will live after them, as Vanzetti had foreseen when he wrote, the taking of our lives, that last agony, is our triumph. Lucky Lindy, up in the sky, there are All dark shadows are banished by Lindbergh's tour. He has displaced everything sordid, writes one reporter. He has exalted the race of men. The kind of a son makes a mother feel proud. Plucky Lindy rides all alone. In a little plane all his own. Lucky Lindy showed them the way and he's the hero of the day. September 30th, thousands come hoping to see Ruth hit the 60th home run that will break his record. But in three trips to the plate, the babe doesn't do it. The season is almost over. It's now the eighth inning of the game with the Washington Senators, and it will be Ruth's last time at bat. Washington's Tom Zachary gets ready. Strike one is called. It's high, a ball. 
Zachary gets ready. The Babe has done it. 60 home runs in one season. One of the greatest records in baseball. Above all, the phenomenon of Lindbergh. What had begun as a courageous stunt ends as much more. As he concludes his tour, the American people see in him a decency and a purity they sense they have lost. In the reckless abandoned year of 1927, through worship of Lindbergh, the entire nation seems to seek a return to innocence. I'll bound away for your big head, unknown, unsung to you. Like an angel in flight, you flew through the night with a whole world praying for you. While you were flying high in the sky, you flew into the heart of the world. With God on his throne, leading you across the home. Like an angel, you flew is almost through, and on Times Square, the excitement of the past fades before the hopeful anticipation of the new year to come. Nineteen twenty-seven was over. Although gaudy and loud, in the end, it marked a subtle change in the American people. For those who greeted the new year of nineteen twenty-eight, there would be new heroes new thrills, new sensations. But never again would they succumb with the same wild, thoughtless abandon. Although they were only dimly aware of it, the era of wonderful nonsense was rapidly running out. 